All right, I think we'll get out of the way. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for being with us again today here at Marquette University Law School next time hall. I'm Mike Boucher. I'm with Professor Charles Franklin, who is the Marquette Law School poll director. And today, obviously, we're releasing the latest edition of the poll. Um, we want to uh, thank you in advance for your time and attention. We're going to go through an awful lot of results today. Hopefully, we'll have a little bit of time at the end for questions from you, the audience. So uh, we'll get right to it, and we'll begin, as we always do, uh, by asking Charles about the, uh, the days when we were in the field, the margin of error, whether or not we're using live interviews, uh, that sort of thing, cell phones. Uh, so why don't you start there, Charles, and tell us uh, when we were in the field on this. Very good. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, we were in the field on uh, July 17th through the 20th, so that was last Thursday through Sunday. Um, we interviewed 804 uh, Wisconsin registered voters, that's the, the total, and we interviewed by both cell phone and landline. Um, uh, cell phones make up about uh, just over a third of the sample, uh, though when the sampler demographically weighted, that actually bounces up to about 40%. Uh, so the rest are landline. Um, and finally, in, in a sample of 804 people, uh, the margin of error is plus or minus three and a half points. Uh, we've been consistently using about 800 people in our samples this last couple of years, or year and a half. And finally, we do this time start to break out likely voters as a subgroup. Uh, we did that for the first time uh, this year. Uh, in May, and we'll move to more emphasis on likely voters next time. So for right now, um, likely voters are people who tell us both they're registered, of course, or they're sure they're going to register by election day, and they're absolutely certain that they will turn out to vote. Um, that makes up 549 respondents in the sample which has a margin of error since it's a little bit smaller subgroup of plus or minus 4.3 percentage points. And again, we always uh, reinforce this, uh, this point that uh, these are live telephone interviews. This is not, uh, not the so-called robocall poll. That's right. Live people. Yeah. All right. Calling during your dinner hour. Yeah. <laughs> Ruining your evening. That's right. That's us. Awesome. Uh, anyhow, let's uh, uh, talk about the, uh, the governor's race, and uh, obviously most people in this room are interested in the matchup between, or likely matchup, I should say, there is a Democratic primary um, likely matchup between a Democrat Mary Burke and Republican uh, incumbent Scott Walker. Uh, but I know uh, before we get to uh, the July numbers, we, we do want to provide a little context, Charles, and you begin with the numbers we had in October, so why don't you walk us through this on a, on a monthly basis, what we've seen so far. Yeah, we've now done enough polls here that I think it's worth it to look at the race in the context of how it's been changing over time. Uh, and maybe it doesn't hurt to build up the suspense before we get into the uh, <laughs> some people headline check numbers. Out. But I know, I know it's tough, uh, but there it is. But quite seriously, I think the trend over time is worth paying some attention to here. So. There actually is a, a bit of a legitimate reason as opposed to just making you sit there for a few more minutes. Uh, so October was the first sample that we asked about a Burke versus Walker matchup, and that showed a pretty close race. Burke at 45, Walker at 47. Uh, by the way, these and almost all of the results I'll read you are for registered voters, the 804 person sample. When we do talk about likely voters, I'll make explicit mention of that, but most of what we're talking about is for registered voters. Um, so that was in October. When we revisited the race in January, there had been a bit of a change. Walker had not changed much, was at 47, but Burke dipped down to 41 in that January poll. Um, then in March, <coughs> Very little change, uh, 48 for Walker, 41 for Burke, uh, so, so no appreciable change. Uh, the, the really major change came between March and May when the race tightened to a dead heat, 46 apiece, among registered voters. And that's 
kind of an interesting pattern that you see here from essentially a tie, just a two-point race inside the margin of error uh, in October, to a, a decent mid to upper single point, single digit lead for Walker in January and, um, and March, but then a dead even tie in May. And so the question was raised, and appropriately so, of was May an outlier, was that an unusual poll, where we seeing a trend? And so, here's July, 45-46, barely changed at all. Uh, so, um, Mary Burke at 45, Scott Walker at 46, uh, inside the margin of error, a phrase that you may hear frequently today. Um, and really no meaningful change from, um, from the May poll to this poll in July. And let's look at all the response options that people had so we can find out how many are undecided, how many say they simply don't know that kind of writing. So this is the, the prime matchup, but if we look at all the other options, you see 4% undecided and another 4% who say they don't know who they vote for. So that's about 8% total who are unsure what they would do if the election were held today. Um, the 0% not vote and the 0% refused over there are probably less than half a percent and it rounded down a little bit. 1% um, say they'll vote for a different party, another party. Um, that was 1.4% in May, it's 0.8% here. So uh, about 1%. And so those are the, the options um, that, that we have. Uh, again, this is for registered voters. We also look at likely voters, and we're going to do something similar here. We'll step back and look at the, the May results. Since that was the first time we began looking at likely voters, again, identifying them. And then we'll look at May and what's happening in July. Right. And, and let me give my little likely voter lecture one more time. This will be the last time you have to hear this. Um, there's a good deal of research that suggests that likely voters are identifying likely voters is not very precise before we get to some kind of close to Labor Day. When people are looking a lot of months out and haven't really started to focus in on the campaign, asking them if they're sure they're going to vote in November turns out to produce a lot of fluctuation just because one day you feel sure you will and another day you feel you won't. Once we get into the fall, that likely voter identification becomes much more stable and much more meaningful. So as a result, our normal practice has been to stick with registered voters early on the grounds that that's a more uh, stable group of people. Uh, but as we get closer to the election, shift to likely voters. Um, because everybody wants to know what likely voters are, even despite the fact that I just told you it may not be the most reliable measure. We did produce a likely voter estimate in, in May, uh, and that was Walker at 48, Burke at 45, a three-point margin, but again, inside the margin of error, because uh, that margin error of error was also about 4.3% in May. So when we come to this time, it's Burke 47, Walker 46 among likely voters. Uh, once more, let's hear it together inside the margin of error and not significantly different from where we were when we were inside the margin of error two months ago. Again, all options, Charles, we present people with uh, a number of options and those numbers. Uh, here, the only thing you see that's really a great note is that undecided and don't know goes from 8% among registered voters to 6% among likely voters, that makes perfect sense. Likely voters are more involved, they're more likely to uh, have strong preferences and to have made up their mind. Uh, at the very least, we have the consistent result that something in the single digits is about how many voters say they really don't know what they're going to do uh, come November. We want to go inside the numbers now. We're going to look at the, some of the, the interesting demographic information uh, you can find in, in these poll results. I'm going to begin by uh, talking about how people identify themselves, uh, see how they feel about this race, if they're a Republican or if they're a Democrat or a self-identified independent. Right. 
Um, so we know that partisanship is a strong factor here, and that's no surprise. What is a little bit interesting is to look at the independents. But if we look at Republicans in May, 94% uh, were standing with Walker, 3% were defecting to Burke. On the Democratic side, it was 87% with Burke among Democrats and 8% crossing over to vote for Walker. The independents are somewhat interesting. 49% uh, were supporting Walker in May to 40%, so a nine-point gap there. Though once more, I have to remind you, this is uh, only about 40% of the sample, so even though it's a nine-point gap, uh, that's pushing the margin of error pretty hard. So I change here in that July. And among partisans, not so much, but a little bit among independents. With independents in July, it's 44% for Burke, 45% for Walker. So that nine-point margin is now a one-point margin, though, again, small sample there, so there's lots of noise. On the other hand, the partisans are nice and stable. Uh, still 93% uh, loyalty among Republicans, 88% among Democrats, really no significant change among those groups. Let's look at this race, Charles, uh, by gender, and, and we see signs already, and maybe not surprising based on some past elections in the state, but we see a gender gap emerging. This is much talked about, of course, but let's dig into it a little bit. So something that we've seen really pretty much all along, men are more favorable to Walker by 51 to 41 this month. Women a little more favorable uh, to Burke uh, by 48, 41. Uh, so you see about a, a 10 point net Walker advantage among men, about a seven point net uh, Burke advantage among women. Charles, let's uh, talk about age for a moment because uh, this shows some signs of having at least a generational uh, uh, feel to it. Uh, let's take a look at what we found on that. Right. All right, this is much talked about as well if the gender gap is one thing, the mobilization of youth and the stalwart <laughs> participation among folks my age uh, shows up. But here, I think the main point is there is a, a bit of an advantage for Burke among the youngest group, the 18 to 29 year olds, where 48% support Burke, 35% Walker. But then, through the other age groups, there's really no consistent pattern. It's dead even at 46 among those 30 to 44. Uh, Walker does best and has a, a noticeable advantage, 51-42, among those 45 to, to 59. And then it's again essentially a tie, 45-46, among people 60 and over. Um, so you see that um, where there's a Burke advantage among the younger voters, and, and they make up about 15 to 16 percent of registered voters in the state, in that 18 to 29 year old group, uh, there's a Burke advantage. But there's also something here that I'm not going to show you a picture of, but voter turnout rises steadily with age. It's one of the most uh, solid findings in social science, if you will, that pretty much for every additional year of age, people become a little bit more likely to vote. And that continues well past the middle of the 70s. Uh, infirmity doesn't really set in until very late in life in terms of reducing voter turnout. So what that means is that the youngest age cohort is also the least likely to turn out, and the older groups become steadily uh, more likely to turn out. But when you get past this 18 to 29 year old group, you see there's really no consistent pattern of age and voter preference. So what that means is that while age effects on turnout are certainly going to be important and interesting to watch, will the young turn out this time in the way they were mobilized in 2004 and again in 8 and again in 12, or will they fall back in their past pattern of uh, being the lowest turnout group? So that's something we'll want to pay attention to as we go forward. Another demographic breakout that we looked at was marital status. 
And this is something that uh, is much talked about in the national media among um, pundits and analysts about what role does marital status play. And we'll look at it two ways. First, simply by whether you're married or not, whether you're a widow, divorced, or separated, and whether you've never been married. Um, for the married group, Governor Walker leads 54 to Mary Burke's 38 uh, percent. But then that reverses among uh, widows and, and divorced and separated people, 53 to 38. And finally, among the never married group, Burke has a 53 to 34 margin. So you can look at the the two ends here as almost mirror images of each other between the married and the never married. Um, but um, you might think that the never married is because a lot of those people are young, right? They're not married yet, but they will eventually get married. And we just saw that age has an effect. But that can't be what's going on among the other kind of single people, the people who have been married in the past, but are now single because of divorce or separation or, or a spouse's death. And in fact, of course, that group is considerably older on average than the population. So here you get some evidence that it's not just an effect of young people not being married, but it's actually a difference between being in a marital relationship versus being single for whatever reason. Let's uh, spend just a couple of moments more, Charles, on each of these categories. We'll begin with the, the married ones, and we'll go even further inside these numbers. I, we're going to be working our way here, but uh, I'll, I'll skip to the chase and simply say there's an awful lot of talk and chatter in the political analyst circles about unmarried women as a critical group. And I'm going to show you right now, just to tell you exactly what you're about to see, I'm going to show you that it ain't just the unmarried women that are exceptional. Let's look at first for married people. For married men, 60% for Walker to just 34% for Burke. Uh, very large uh, gap in support there. But for married women, remember women on balance as a group as a whole prefer Burke by a little bit. Uh, but among married women, 49% uh, for Walker, 42% for Burke. So um, Governor Walker is leading among married people for both men and women, but with an exceptionally large margin uh, among men. How about those who never married? When we, when we move to these folks, it's the reverse of the pattern, but let me go straight to the unmarried women. 60% for Burke, only 23% for Walker. So you see that that margin, that gap among unmarried women is a little bit bigger between Burke and Walker than the opposite gap was among married men between, with favoring Walker. But both of them are the opposites here that are the largest gaps we see that have something to do with gender and marital status. Um, but if you look at the never married men, you see that they too favor Burke over Walker by 4840. Uh, so once more, we see that both marital status and gender are playing a role here. Men who are married being exceptional in one direction, women who are unmarried being exceptional in the other but the other gender groups uh, in between. And for those who are widowed or divorced. And here, once again, we get to look and make sure this is not just age masquerading as marital status. Uh, for those folks who are single through uh, being widowed or divorced, um, this, a similar gap appears. For women, it's uh, 55 for Burke, 34 for Walker here. Uh, for men, it's 50 to 44 in favor of, of Burke. So the same kind of pattern we saw earlier for marital status holds up when we break it down by, merit, uh, by, by gender. And within gender and within marital status, people who are single, again, look pretty similar to each other, if maybe not quite as extreme if you look at the these unmarried women compared to the never married women in the first 
Yeah, in the, in the second graph. Let's talk job approval. This is something we measure uh, each and every poll. We'll begin uh, with the governor, and, and again, we'll put a little context uh, around yeah. this discussion. So, uh, over the long haul, the governor's job approval has fluctuated, but if we said it's 49% plus or minus a couple, that would cover almost all of our polls. Um, in May, that was the case, approval at 49, disapproval at 46. Uh, when we move to July, it's approval at 47, disapproval at 48. So a little tick down, again, inside the margin of error. I warned you, almost all of the changes we're seeing from May to July are statistically not significant. They're, they're within that margin of error. Um, uh, if you jumped back to March, the balance was 47-47. So if you think of uh, uh, job approval has been at 47, then 49, now back to 47. Disapproval has been at 47, 46, 48. There's not a lot of movement there. It's bouncing around <coughs> just a little bit. Um, it's also, at least for two out of three of these, just at the bottom edge of that 49 plus or minus two range I mentioned earlier. It looks like maybe the governor's approval rating is just a shade lower on average now than it was averaging, say, in 2013. Um, but certainly not dramatic differences, and at least so far, we can't spot a, uh, a statistically reliable trend either up or down. Another question that we ask routinely is, is the state, do you feel the state is on moving in the right direction or is it on the wrong track? Pretty standard political question. Now, and part of this is to get at the big picture, uh, and what we see here is people are pretty optimistic. 54% say we're headed in the right direction, 41% say the wrong track. Yes, I, I'm going to respond to that because I understand. Uh, uh, back in March it was 54-42, in May it was 52-42. So there's a little bit of a disconnect here between people saying the, country, the, the state is headed in the right direction and not being quite as enthusiastic about the governor. It's not a massive difference, but it's a four, five, six point uh, difference between the two. And so uh, an interesting question that uh, unfortunately I won't be able to give you the answer to today, but it's worth exploring is if the state's headed in the right direction, is that just expressing a general optimism that we're climbing out of the recession, things are getting better? Or is it a view of the state and its progress that specifically has a component of how do you think the governor is doing as part of that? It seems clear that it, both of those would be a piece of this. Some of it would reflect the governor's performance. Some of it would reflect other things. Uh, we do see that when we ask about the economy as a whole, people have gotten just a little bit more positive about the economy over the last few months. Uh, there's still about 25% that expect worse times or think we're getting worse, uh, but in the mid to upper 30s say we're getting better, and then uh, also somewhere in the 30s say we're staying the same. So there's a little growth of optimism there. Um, so some of this may reflect perceptions of national conditions rather than just the governor's performance. In, in recent polls, we've asked about a number of issues, and, and we have done that again this time. Not all of the issues that are out there, but a few that we have uh, sort of focused on. One of them is uh, Wisconsin's budget situation. We're asking people whether or not they think the budget situation today is better than it was a few years ago. What did we find? Uh, uh, clearly the budget and the budget repair bill are signature elements of the governor's record. And so we asked first in January, um, do you think the state budget is in better shape than a few years ago, about the same or worse shape? And these January data are here. 49% better, 26 the same, only 20% thought we were in worse shape. That January poll was in the field right after new budget estimates had come out suggesting we would have a larger than expected uh, revenue uh, stream at that point. 
uh, and also at the time of the governor's State of the State address. Uh, and so it was sort of a high point of positive news, if you will, um, about how the state was doing. If we come forward to July, uh, some of those uh, revenue advantages have been uh, used for tax cuts, which other data that we have uh, from previous surveys shows are relatively popular. But there have also been some uh, legislative reports showing that we're not getting quite the revenue that we were expecting to get. So it's been a little bit of mixed signals on this. The upshot is not much change, and again, not statistically significant change, but a little bit of downward movement on better from 49 to 45. Um, but the worst hardly changed at all, 20 or 22. I would certainly not rush to suggest that this is a developing trend. Uh, we'd want to watch this quite a while. Certainly the size of the movement is not enough at this point to statistically conclude that anything has really changed about this. Um, but regardless of statistical differences, you'd certainly look at that uh, percent better, whether it's 49 or 45, and it's clear that the largest single group thinks the state's budget's in better shape than it was. Let's talk for a moment about job creation. This is something we've also been looking at. The governor, of course, uh, promised 250,000 new jobs during his first four years in office. Democrats are trying to make this a big issue that he will apparently fall short of that total. Uh, again, just a little context as we, we look at how the public feels about how we're performing in terms of job creation. Um, in May, we got we asked the question. We've asked the question: Do you think you'll reach the 250,000 jobs promise? Eighty percent have twice told us, "No, we're not going to get there." So we haven't been repeating that question. It doesn't seem likely to have changed. Instead, we focused on a question we've been asking for a fair bit of time: Do you think the state is creating jobs faster? about the same or lagging behind other states. Um, so in May, 13% uh, said faster, 38% said the same, 43% said lagging behind. In the time since then, we've had um, the quarterly census of employment report come out in June, uh, which is um, by everyone's uh, agreement uh, the best standard for measuring job performance. And it showed us at 37th in the country, we've been 35th, 36th, 37th, so it's been pretty consistent over time. Um, so that's the new piece of news here. There's almost no change. A little bit of a downturn in saying we're creating jobs faster from 13 to 9, a four-point dip. Um, but lagging barely changed, 43 versus 43, actually. Uh, those folks that thought we were a little better now think we're about the same. So this is an issue that, of course, the political sides on both sides have, have paid an awful lot of attention to. We have seen over the last two years lagging get as high as 49 and as low as 40. So right now... It uh, this has been a, a, an issue in this campaign, maybe not as big here as in some places, but still an issue in right. uh, And one of the issues where both candidates pretty expressly disagree on the right. position on the issue. So in March, 63% uh, supported an increase in the minimum wage, 33% opposed. Um, I'll remind you that in our question, we say some people say raising the minimum wage would help uh, low-income people. Others say raising the minimum wage would reduce jobs in hiring. So we're trying to balance the question with both the pro and con considerations of, of a minimum wage change. 63% uh, support, 33% oppose. But when you come to July, that's changed a little bit. The 63 is down to 56. Seven-point drop, one of the larger changes that we've seen, though, Remember, this is March to July, not June to, or uh, May to July. And opposition at 39%, up a little bit from the 33 that it was before. So there may be a little bit of shifting going on on the minimum wage um, question, but uh, a significant majority 
still supporting an increase in the wage. Uh, another question we've asked about, because it's been in the news lately, is the same-sex marriage ban, as everybody in this room knows the state has the same-sex marriage ban. It was part of a constitutional amendment uh, that, that passed back in 2006, and public supported it at that time. We've been asking a question, trying to get a public attitudes uh, that, that essentially says, uh, if you could vote on it today, would you vote to retain the same-sex marriage ban, or would you vote to repeal it? So we first asked this in March, before the court ruled on, on this, and at that point, 36% said they'd retain it, 59% said they'd repeal it. Uh, the amendment passed with 59% of the vote uh, in 2006. Uh, but when we come to July, then only a very small change, 37% would retain, 56% would repeal, one more time, inside the margin of error. So very little indication that either the court's rulings or the week or so of marriages that took place and then the um, uh, stopping of that and, and now the appeal, none of that seems to have produced any large spread shift, widespread shift in opinion on the issue. Let's take a look at the, the uh, results we got for the favorable, unfavorable questions we asked. We asked this of a number of elected officials. Uh, let's begin with Mary Burke. Now, so there are two things to watch for with Burke. One is just how many people are unable to express an opinion about her. Uh, as a newcomer to statewide electoral politics, uh, in October, 70% of the sample said they either hadn't heard enough about her or they didn't know if they had a favorable or unfavorable view. That was still 70% in January. It fell to 59% in March and fell again to 51% in May. And I'll put that slide up now. So if you put the two on the right together, the 46 and the 54 and the 5, that's the 51% unable to rate her as of May. Her favorables were slightly net positive, 27 to 22, uh, a plus 5 net positive, but clearly still half the electorate unable to, to, uh, to judge her or give her a rating. Uh, when we move to July, again, not much has changed. Um, this is where... <laughs> I've told some people that I'm frankly usually surprised by the data. There's stuff here that I didn't really expect. I thought she had established a pattern of picking up about eight or nine or ten points of recognition every couple of months because that fit the movement from January to March and again March to May. And yet it flattened out between May and July with very little change during that time. It's now 49% unable to rate her. So it seems like during these last two months, voters really have not uh, picked up new information about her. She's still net favorable by a small amount, 26 to 24, uh, but that again inside the margin of error. Let's look at the numbers for uh, Governor Walker on this question, both uh, May and July. Uh, well, not surprisingly, almost everybody's heard of Governor Walker. Uh, only 4% unable to rate him in May. Uh, but it's favorable, unfavorable, uh, right at the cusp. 47 favorable, 48 unfavorable. When we come to July, it's 45 favorable, 47 unfavorable, inside the margin of error. And a little strange bump up in the not heard and don't know. Uh, I, maybe people are having a little memory loss here. Um, or maybe it's new residents to the state, I don't know. Um, the best answer, though, is don't try to read much substance into this. This could very easily and almost certainly is just sample error. And again, the bottom line is that for neither Burke nor Walker, uh, people really haven't started to change. Now, I will say that your last week was quite an active week in the campaign. The first week in which we saw both campaigns putting up new ads, going back and forth at each other, uh, lots of news coverage, breaking positions like the changing Common Core position from the, or the opposition to Common Core from the governor. Um, uh, I won't go through the litany of everything that's happened over the last seven to ten days, but the point is we are now in the campaign period. 
The survey, though, got in the field just as that was beginning. And there's some people that think that when a campaign ramps up like that, all of the public instantly responds to it. But I think you should bet, bet that if 49% of the public hasn't learned enough about Mary Burke to have an opinion about her yet, it's going to take a little more time for campaign effects to really build. So I think our data, even though it's taken just as the campaign is really ramping up, is still a decent measure of where we were in that sort of um, long, phony war period of, uh, you know, the campaign's doing a little bit, they're doing a lot of traveling around, but the air wars really hadn't begun, and the campaigns hadn't engaged each other in an intense way until just recently. So, more reason to look forward to the next poll. Sure. <laughs> we ask a, a question, that I sometimes refer to it as the empathy question, but campaigns are always very interested to see whether or not their candidate uh, sort of resonates with the public. Does the public relate to them? Do they feel like their candidate is on their side? So we ask that question. It always produces some interest in that. So uh, in May, does Mary Burke care about people like you? 39 says she does. Uh, 29 says does not. And 31% uh, again, not familiar enough to have an opinion. When we move to July, that's hardly changed, 38, 31, 30. So again, the picture, very little is changing about people's perceptions. And for the governor, and for the governor in May, he was upside down on this question. 44% cares, 52% uh, does not, uh, with very few undecided or don't know. When we move to July, there's not been much change in that, 45, 49. Uh, so this is going to be one that's interesting to watch. The Burke campaign's early ads have been mentioning this theme. Um, when we looked at the Senate race in 2012, we saw some real changes in perceptions on this across uh, the course of the campaign. So whether that will happen this time or not remains to be seen. There are a little bit of differences uh, between the two candidates in, in this perception. We also ask people if they think uh, that the candidates can get things done. Is that something that describes the candidate? It must be getting my hairy bird. If, if governing is uh, partly about making the trains run in time and getting things done, you'd think this would, would add up to something. Uh, with Burke, 36% say it gets things done, does describe her, 26% does not. But 38% again don't know in May. Hardly changed in July when it's 36, uh, say that gets things done, describes her 28% say it does not, 35% say they don't know. But this is a real strength of Governor Walker. In um, May, 68%, fully 68%, two thirds, more than two thirds, said gets things done, describes Governor Walker. When you look at his job approval rating, it's clear that not every one of those people approves of the things that he gets done, but the image of him as an effective person able to accomplish things, uh, or at least get things done, whether you agree with him or not, was quite strong. Only 28% saying that does not describe him. When we move to July, basically unchanged again, uh, down Insignific insignificantly, two-thirds, 66%, uh, say gets things done, describes the governor, 29% um, say it does not. So and there's really, again, been no change um, on this. And it was interesting, Charles and I were just talking about this the other day, the governor did an interview with the Washington Post recently, and he mentioned that very finding that he said, you know, people don't expect politicians to get things done. I get things done. Was, the wording was quite similar even to the poll results, so he's talking that as a campaign mm -hmm. uh, a messaging uh, thing. Um, let's talk about the John Doe for a second, yep. Charles, because we have polled on this on a number of occasions. Uh, obviously, uh, quite a few things have happened since I think we last polled on this. We've kind of moved into the second phase. We've had lawsuits. We've had um, we had uh, the governor himself uh, speak out on this for the first time. Um, a lot has happened, and so we decided to ask about it again. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, again, all of these things Mike is talking about, and the public 
discussion of it and the court orders and the release of documents has all happened between calls. Um, but what we find here in July is three quarters, 75 percent, say they've heard or read something about the, the Doe investigation. Uh, 24 percent say they've not heard anything. Uh, One percent say uh, just the name. Um, um, and so that's, that's a pretty striking number. There's an awful lot of political issues that don't reach 75% awareness or, uh, or so. On the other hand, uh, back in October of 2012, we had the previous John Doe investigation. And at that point, 76% said they had heard about it. So in a sense, if you think of the two investigations, uh, both have hit essentially equal penetration or saturation of the public with three and four voters being aware of the, um, of the process. And uh, how do people feel about this? Because we've given them a pretty simple choice in terms of what they think. Yes. Um, we actually ask a question that comes from the Watergate era. Uh, do you think the John Doe investigation is just more politics? Or is it really something serious? Um, and just more politics, 54%. Really something serious, 42%. Now, this is only of those people who said they had heard about it, of course. Um, here, there's a little bit of a difference. If we go back to October 12 and that Joe process, 46% said just politics, 45% said something serious. So. Uh, it was more evenly balanced uh, about two years ago. This one tilts a little more, 54%, to uh, just politics, a little less uh, to something really serious. Charles, we ask a, a question about likely voters, and maybe you can explain what this question is about, and, uh, and also offer perhaps a little comparison to uh, another election yeah. years gone by. Uh, I, I mentioned it earlier, likely voters are something that you hear about in polling and voting analysis all the time. Different pollsters use different ways of going about it. Some, like the Gallup organization, ask a battery of a dozen or more questions, which they then use to try to decide who's really going to go vote and who's not. Um, others use just one or two questions. We use just one which is uh, how sure are you that you will go to the polls and vote in November? Absolutely certain, pretty certain, somewhat certain about 50-50 or there's a chance I won't vote. And we use the uh, people who say they're absolutely certain to vote as our measure of likely voters. Um, uh, that's in line with a number of other pollsters that use a single question like this, though again, different from the way some organizations do with real batteries of questions. Uh, we've gone with the simpler approach because the, the research on this suggests pretty strongly that very complicated likely voter models are often not very good. And just letting people tell us if they're going to vote or not and take them at their word is a pretty reasonable thing to do. Um, when we look at that, 68% today, this month, are saying that they're absolutely sure they will vote in the fall. Now, Wisconsin is a high turnout state, so we always have high turnout. And remember, we're starting with a base of people who are already registered to vote. The best single predictor, predictor of who will vote is whether they're registered to vote. And so it's not at all surprising that we have a very high number here. In a high turnout election in the state, we can hit 90% of registered voters who actually show up at the polls. So 68% by that standard is pretty high, but not super high. But if you go back and look at it in October of 12, it was 88% who were saying they were certain they were going to vote. So this drop off between presidential year, uh, between presidential year electorate and midterm electorate is very clearly showing up in our data uh, with really a 20 point difference and the percentage of people who say are saying they're sure that we'll vote. I'll break, break this down by a political ID, how people identify themselves. Um, 
always an interesting question is which party has an advantage on this and how does that change over time? Um, and the result here is uh, Republicans 72 percent likely voters, but Democrats just a shade higher at 75 percent. Uh, independents, as is often the case, quite a bit behind that, only 63 percent of independents saying they're absolutely sure they'll vote. Um, one more time, 72 versus 75 is inside the margin of error. Don't conclude that that means Democrats have an advantage here. But the tip, just a little bit, the tilt, is uh, slightly in the Democrats' favor. Uh, both parties uh, like to talk a lot about their get out the vote efforts. Ours is better than theirs. And we make price strides. And so we, we wanted to ask people uh, who were um, taking these questions uh, whether or not they did contact you by a, a campaign or a party. Right. Um, I'm also going to show you enthusiasm, though, first, just real quick. A lot of pollsters have been asking how enthusiastic are you about voting rather than how likely are you to vote. Here, that reverses just a little bit. 60% of Republicans say they're very enthusiastic. 56% uh, uh, of Democrats say they're very enthusiastic. So it's a little bit of a reversal of that first slide on likely voters. I think, again, the conclusion would be there's really probably no difference right now in how mobilized they are. But those parties are coming after you, and they're going to get you. Um, we asked people if they'd been contacted by a party or a campaign in just the last month, and fully a third, 33%, said they'd been contacted by a party in this last month. Uh, so two-thirds hadn't, but they will be. Um, and by party, I mean. And by party, which party's out there knocking on doors and calling? Um, contacted only by the Democrats, about 9%, or sorry, 14%. Only by the Republicans, 25%. But a lot of voters, 53%, say they've been contacted by both parties at some time in the last month. Um, a lot of phone banking and, and door knocking going on. Um, but the partisans are not quite equally likely to be contacted, and this is sort of interesting. Republicans over here on the right are very unlikely, only 7% in that green bar say they've been contacted only by the Democrats. Versus 35% by Republicans only and 49% by both. When we go to the Republicans, I'm sorry, the, that was the Republicans here. The Democrats in the middle, on the other hand, are about equally likely, 27% only by the rep Republicans, 29% only by the Democrats. I said that backwards, sorry. 27 only by the Democrats, 29 only by the Republicans. And again, 42% have been contacted by both. But you see the people that both parties really want are the independents over there on the right. 64% of independents said they've been contacted uh, by uh, both parties. Don't want to uh, avoid taking questions today, and we'll try to get to a couple here at the end, but I just want to take two minutes to, to talk about two other uh, things in respect to this poll. First one is probably some people in the audience will say, why don't you have any results on the primary and the attorney general's race? Why not? Right. Small sample, small turnout. Um, if we have a 20, maybe a 25 percent turnout in the, in the primary, out of our sample of 800 people, that would suggest we'd only have a couple of hundred likely voters in that primary. And that seems too small to produce trustworthy results, especially in a race where both, well, I shouldn't say both, all three candidates, and really, though there's not a Republican primary, all four candidates for attorney general are still just beginning to penetrate public awareness. I think that we would not be able to produce reliable results trying to get uh, a very modest sized sample of the Democratic primary. Um, doing that better would require a different sampling design than what we do, one that probably uses voter lists as the basis of the sampling, and that's dramatically different than what we do. So rather than produce results that we don't feel are very reliable because of the low turnout and therefore the low sample size, we decided not to pursue that this time. 
I can promise you we will certainly cover the Attorney General's race for the statewide race in August, um, because at that point the small sample size issue will go away completely. It will be a statewide race. And we always encourage you to, to go to our website and check out all of the results that are there. We're as transparent as possible on this, uh, on this polling project. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, in this survey, as in some past surveys, there are a number of questions that are completely unrelated to, to politics. And uh, i give you a chance to say a couple of words about that. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that the Marquette Law School poll has done is to provide a platform for research by scholars here at the university, uh, some here in the law school, but some in other parts of the university as well. And, and that research has uh, paid off in publications and uh, research grants and uh, especially among younger uh, scholars advancing careers. So we've been very pleased to do that. Uh, in July's, we've had a habit of asking questions for Professor Michael O'Hare, who's here in the law school, uh, and his colleague Darren Wheelock, also in the, in the university, uh, who are pursuing a, a research program on uh, criminal justice, uh, questions of sentencing, parole, and related matters. So if you go to the website, you'll see a set of questions that go to those issues. Um, but uh, rather than venture into an area that's outside of my particular expertise, uh, we will be letting Michael and Darren pursue that both at the Marquette Law School faculty blog, uh, where Michael will be producing presenting some results and through his or their uh, scholarly research down the line. So in keeping with our policy that we put up all of the data from every poll, all of the questions, all of the top line results, all of that is on the website, uh, but properly speaking, some of those items are for um, Professor O'Hare's research. Charles, thanks. Let's, Let's take, take a couple of questions. questions. We do have a few minutes left. Uh, we'll take a few. Yes, sir. Um, and, and, and I would ask you to press down on that little rim there so everybody can, no, not on the button, but on the rim. Just keep your finger right down on that and we'll be able to hear your question. Thanks very much. What percentage of the people do you call agree to cooperate and has that changed over time? Oh, yeah. It's a huge problem in the survey industry, um, but you have to be careful of terms. If you answer your telephone, we got cooperation about half the time. Uh, but you often don't pick up your phone, do you? Uh, and so the response rate, which is the total number of uh, completed interviews, 804, divided by the total number of telephone numbers that we've dialed, is below 10%. It's about 8%. That sounds horrifically bad. It's actually right where the industry is these days. The shocking thing is that it hasn't produced an increase in error in election forecasting. If we look at forecasts based on polls from the 1970s and 80s, where you'd routinely have a, an unbelievable 75 or 80 percent response rate, not cooperation, but response rate, those polls ultimately didn't predict election outcomes better than what we're getting now with very low response rates. And the reason is people don't answer their phones because they don't want to be bothered, not because of their politics. If it were the case that all Democrats refused to answer their phones, then we would have a huge problem. If all Republicans refused to answer their phone, we'd have a huge problem. But the good news is Grumpiness is a bipartisan affair. Um, but I would appreciate it if all of you would answer your phones and just see if it's us calling. You can hang up on anybody else. Just check and see if it's us. All right, other questions? Yes, Bruce. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, just pull down on the side. Okay, there you go. The light light light. Light. Oh, there for you. I, I was intrigued in looking at the cross tabs on your last poll that you asked a question whether you prefer someone with a business background or a political background. And the intriguing thing is more Republicans prefer the person with a business background. Did you ask that question again? And is it sort of aligning with yeah. the candidates? We did not ask the question again. It's always possible we would come back to it. 
I think that's a great example where people answer a question thinking in general of what they want, but they don't necessarily apply it to the particular two candidates in front of them. Uh, if we see those two bars so that 88 or 93 percent of Republicans start voting for Burke and 88 percent of Democrats start voting for Walker, maybe we'll see a, a real change there. But, but interestingly, actually, joking aside, lots of Democrats wanted a business background as well, so it wasn't just a partisan uh, difference in there. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah. Any point? Um, the, as you mentioned, the campaigns really ramped up in the last week. First of all, is there concern that their activity was intended to influence the results of your poll? <laughs> and um, have you thought about keeping when you're in the field quiet or the privacy people? I mean, everyone sure. knew you were going out. Sure. Um, yeah, this is an interesting question. Uh, first of all, if that's their campaign strategy, I think they <laughs> might want to reconsider. Um, uh, a fairly serious answer to it is, it's hard to move the electorate if you could do it by just ramping up for three or four days to influence the poll. Uh, I think elections would be a lot more dynamic than they really are. So for those reasons, I think none of the scholarly evidence suggests that short-term efforts like that are likely to be effective. It is true that a complete debacle at a debate can produce quick change. In some we actually saw position. that with the, the Romney-Obama uh, uh, right. debate, a huge <laughs> jump in it, Romney's. Uh, That's right. Congress. After that first uh, debate, we saw a big change in a hurry. So it can happen, but I'm, I'm doubtful that the run of the mill would happen. The other is we've announced our polls uh, seven to ten days in advance since the very beginning. So this is not new. And in 2012, we saw parties and some outside pollsters released results on Wednesday morning an hour or two before our release. That was actually a good thing because it allowed us to take their results, put them in our slides at the last minute, and we could see them in context. Because I'd rather have more polls, not fewer. Uh, so I think, you know, if people want to do that, they can. The final point is, since we make it public, and, and as I say, we've put it on our website from the very beginning, we do send a press advisory now a little more aggressively than we used to. Um, it's public information. Both parties know it. Everybody that's campaigning knows it. So there's no secrets here. It's open to everybody. Let me take one final question. We have one minute left. Not the ball, but the uh, rim. Oh, okay. There you Heartburn. <laughs> Over numbers that putting my, my strategy. You're talking like about this one? Yes. Yeah. Where I'm literally going, wow. Yeah. Because that's who's better at IDing their, their voters. Yeah. And it's just an amazing number. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be a little cautious about that. And certainly the interpretation of which party's doing a better job. Because an alternative interpretation is the Democrats are doing a better job of identifying their supporters and more importantly, identifying Republican supporters and not spending their time contacting them, right? The two parties are doing about the same when it comes to contacting Democrats. And there's a bit of a difference among independents, but both parties clearly are getting through there. So my point is simply, there's a selection process here of, you know, in all those data banks that both parties have, it's letting them target people. It could be that one side's doing better than the other. It could be that all the phone banks that have been set up, and Republicans especially have talked a lot about their, their efforts, are being effective. You know, with television advertising, we all get to see the ads, and we get to have companies that count the ads for us. So we know a lot about TV advertising. But it's to get out the vote efforts that really flies below the radar. So. This is a gross estimate of what's going on, but it misses the precision of, you know, are these differences because of deliberate differences in strategy? Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so I think it might be worth it to tell the story both ways and see what conclusions you reach depending on how you look at it. But.
Two things before we go. Uh, first, uh, we will be polling throughout the remainder of this uh, election cycle, so we hope you'll join us again for these events. Uh, we enjoy having you uh, come and uh, hear Charles uh, tell us about the results and also sort of analyze uh, what we found. The other thing I wanted to let you know is that in the next couple of weeks or so, we'll begin to announce uh, the fall schedule for the On the Issues series. So these events will be part of the series, but there will be many others, and we hope that you'll attend those. So again, thanks very much for your uh, time today, your interest, and we'll see you next time.